chosen to tell these types of stories is a form of comic book called manga. The art form originated in Japan and has been made popular by its animated counterpart, anime. Manga dominates sales of the graphic novel market in North America, with a diverse audience of readers of all ages, um, including a majority of female readers. And my favorite aspect of the manga industry is its um, unconstrained storytelling. You can tell all kinds of different um, stories in manga. It isn't um, the you know the American comic book industry is very like superhero or Archie comics, <laughs> like that's kind of you know stereotypically the the two types of comics you have. But in manga, there's like you're not constrained. It doesn't matter whatever kind of story you want to tell, you can tell um, in comic books. <coughs> So this is a page from um, one of my favorite manga series called Nana uh, by a woman named Ayazawa. The title sold over 43 million copies and is still running in Japan. Um, it's broken sales records in Japan, selling even more than the hugely popular Naruto, um, which is also very popular over here. With only 19 selling 780,000 copies in one week. Um, I think this series is a perfect example of what manga can do that traditional American comic books haven't been able to. Uh, produce a highly successful series with mature storytelling that appeals to an audience composed primarily of women. So what would happen if you took the appealing elements of a great manga like Nana took advantage of its access to a diverse audience, um, especially an audience composed mostly of females, and infused it with humanist and skeptical values. What would happen when you merge science and manga? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, excuse me. I think it could be a, a, a little clearer, a little better focus. I, I don't know how to do that. Oh. <laughs> Okay, so this is a uh, longer rendition of the original and next generation Star Trek cast. I actually have this, as a super nerdy, geeky side note, I have this signed by a learned in one of the chat. <laughs> but this isn't exactly what I have in mind. Obviously, sci-fi uh, sci is a great way to get people interested in science using storytelling. Um, but even though I'm a huge, you know, sci-fi Star Trek nerd, I understand that it can sometimes have a narrow, a narrow appeal. Um, and I'd like to do more than just uh, give sci-fi stories a manga makeover. One series that helped me think about this is a cheesy '80s cartoon called Masters of the Universe. Yes, this is He-Man. <laughs> I was one of the millions of kids who re religiously watched this science fantasy cartoon that was produced for the sole purpose of selling Mattel's line of action figures. The line of action figures came before the cartoon. Um, and it did it with great success. Um, it's your basic good versus evil story that mixes sci-fi technology with swords and sandals magic. Um, but what I found interesting about this series and the back on it, and the reason why I even bother mentioning the campy cartoon at all, um, is that it wasn't another magic against science or technology versus nature story. Both sides use magic and both sides use technology. And it was a story of the bad guys who use technology to destroy and they abuse it versus the good guys who use it um, responsibly, which I think is much more better you know, message to tell than the typical you know, the scientists with the technology versus the magical nature people. <laughs> yeah. um, the conflict of the series as well was um, centered on a cast 
castle that contained the secrets of the universe. And the key to becoming masters of the universe universe was not through conquering land or acquiring wealth, um, but through obtaining power through knowledge, which this is my, my favorite part looking back <laughs> on this, was that they didn't want the castle with the king and queen of attorney and the bad guys were <coughs> and that. They wanted Castle Grayskull with all the knowledge in it. So even the bad guys, you know, valued knowledge. And it was a story about, you know, um, you know, those who have knowledge are the masters of the universe. They, yeah. <laughs> they have the power. <laughs> um, <coughs> so I think this kind of story sort of can lay a foundation for building an interest in science through that subtle message of valuing knowledge. Um, and I think there's another example of a series with mass appeal um, that unexpectedly accomplishes this. Oops, I went all the way to the end, didn't I? <laughs> ah. And you need more knowledge. <laughs> I need more knowledge of PowerPoint. <laughs> okay. <coughs> this is Harry Potter. I didn't draw this, by the way. Um, I think. Harry Potter <laughs> is another example of like, okay, obviously, how can how can Harry Potter promote science? It's about witches and wizards and magic. Um, but I think subtly it does. Um, it, I think it has a lot of um, good messages about critical thinking. Um, again, through this subtle message of valuing knowledge, the main characters are very curious and inquisitive. They do well in school, and I don't think it matters that it's a school of magic. They still have to work hard and get good grades. And um, they question authority, and they get nowhere without book smarts and problem solving. And the entire first book is basically a lesson in the dangers of relying on their intuition and acting based on preconceptions about people or things.